This morning, it's my privilege to bring to you the Word of God. I'll be on Psalm 119, verses 49 to 56. Psalm 119, verses 49 to 56. The uh, title for this message is The Incredible Benefits of the Word of God. The Incredible Benefits of the Word of God. So as we begin our time, just a simple question. Why would a believer want to spend time in the Word of God? Why would they want to do that? And I, I know you're saying that it, that is basic. It's a basic question. But I firmly believe that the Christian life and living out the Christian life really comes back to the basics virtually all the time. So why would a believer want to spend time in the Word of God? Certainly there are many who spend time in the Word for the simple reason that God has commanded it. And that is important. But we need to understand that God commanded it for a reason. It wasn't just to teach us discipline. It was not that this act of obedience would necessarily demonstrate our faithfulness to the Lord. There's, there's just so much more to what God intends for us to understand from his word. In this particular section of Psalm 119, it's, it's been called a stanza of remembrance in this sense. I'm going to give you three points, but these are not the points for my sermon, so if you put them down, it's going to confuse you in a moment. They're separate. But it does give you an idea where the psalmist is going in this, in this short section. It's been called a psalm of remembrance because it begins with the, the psalmist asking God to remember his word to the psalmist. You know, God, please remember your word, essentially your promises to me. But then later on in the psalm, the, the psalmist understands his personal responsibility and, and he, he declares that, that I want to remember the ancient words. The psalmist needs to remember the ancient words. And then when you come to the end of this section, the psalmist reminds us how important it is to remember the author of the word, the God of the word. So you'll see that woven through this particular section. But for those that take notes, I want to talk to you about seven incredible benefits from the Word of God. Seven benefits from the Word of God. Now, in Psalm 119, 49, it begins with this word, and when I get to the first benefit, I'll tell you. He starts by saying, remember the word to your servant. Remember the word to your servant. So let's begin considering the fact that God has given to us his word. Folks, God was under no obligation to give us anything, okay? He was under no obligation to give us anything. Nevertheless, he's given to us his word. And consider the different things that God has told us about in this word. Because he's very deliberate, what's in here. So he told us about the past. He didn't have to do that. But he actually tells us about how this world came into being, the details of that. I mean, you guys, look at what the word world comes up with for how the world came into existence. You see how bad it is if you don't have the word of God? I mean, really, an explosion. Makes sense? I mean, honestly. So designed from catastrophe, really. Anyways, we won't go there. Chaz will do that later. Talk to Chaz. <laughs> you won't hear another thing I said today. He's focused on that now. Amen. But you guys, think about it. <laughs> God has given us details so that we can understand. Or, or how about, uh, how did life get the way that it is? Why, why, why is the world the way it is currently? Why are we here I mean, for, for people who don't have the Word of God, do you realize how disorienting that is? I mean, why am I really here? What is this life about? What is sin? What is sin? You know, from the very beginning of time, every man did what was right in his own eyes. 
If God doesn't define sin, we don't have a definition for sin because people will do whatever they think they have the right to do. But God defines it, and we need that. What does it mean to die? We sang some great songs this morning. Keep singing them until you make that transition, folks. Sometimes it's easier to sing them when you're healthy and life is good. But someday, you're likely not going to be healthy. And God's going to take you. But see, God tells us what it means to die. Can you imagine if we didn't have that information? Who is God? What is He like? God has given to us that truth. How can we have a relationship with God? Should we even want a relationship with God? How can a sinful person ever please a holy God? Can you imagine what life would be like if we didn't have the Word of God? It would just be awful. So now, how about this? How many of you have ever struggled remembering things? Hmm. It's a problem, isn't it? It's a problem. I hear when you get older, it gets worse. <laughs> Shh. I'm saying, I don't want my wife to be talking about me. You know, we can forget what we said. I mean, we can forget what we did. People come to me, remember that one youth activity 30 years ago, Rock? And it's like, nope. <laughs> Hope it was fun. <laughs> Hope it was productive. Can you imagine if God was like us? Forget what he says? Or just changes his mind? You know, I don't want to do that anymore. If he was dishonest, this life was just a game? You see, God's not like us. God is not like us. When the psalmist says, remember the word to your servant, it's not because he questions God's faithfulness to his word. He's just expressing to the master how dependent he is on God's word. Your word is everything to me. God is so kind to give us his word. And so kind to tell us so much about himself and so much about life and so much about the future. What a gracious God. We need that information. You know, the psalmist, it's interesting, he says, remember the word to your servant. To your servant. I've been thinking about that one a lot because I'll be frank with you, when I sit down in the word, I get in a habit of spending time and regular time, but, but I, I don't generally sit down and, and even as I'm preparing to get into the word, say, God, here I am, your servant, wanting to hear what my master says. I mean, I'll be honest. I'm going to do it more now. But there's a good picture there. Because when the psalmist refers to himself as a servant, you understand that what he's, what he's expressing is, I'm the servant and God is my master, and I, I come to his word because I need instructions from the master. You know, how can you be a good servant and not know what the master is saying? Not know what he wants. And so the psalmist comes to God's word saying, remember the word to your servant. Because he, he understands how important it is that he has this appropriate relationship with his master as it relates to the truth of his word. I think it is a reasonable question when we talk about God and a relationship with him to, to say, do you consider yourself a servant of the master? Because a good servant is vastly more concerned about what the master wants than about what the servant wants. And the good servant wants desperately to know how to please his master. And so that is a reflection of the heart of the psalmist. In Joshua 24, 15, it says, If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, 
Choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. And then this famous phrase, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. That ought to be the heart of God's children. In Matthew 6, 24, it says, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth. Or Jesus says in John 12, 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. I mean, that's the essence of being a servant, right? You can't really say, I'm your servant, and not do what the master says. <laughs> it makes no sense. You're not a servant. So he says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Romans 6.16, do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? See, if you're a servant of God, you understand you need God's word. You desperately need God's word. The life of a true servant is to please his master. And as God's servants, as we sit here today, we should want to please him more than any other thing in this entire world. Spurgeon says he asks, the psalmist asks for no new promise, but to have the old word fulfilled. He is grateful that he has received so good a word. He embraces it with all his heart and now entreats the Lord to deal with him according to it. He does not say, remember my service to thee, but thy word to me. So in this same verse, verse 49, remember the word to your servant. Here's the first great benefit of God's word in which you have made me hope. You've given me expectation. The psalmist gets it. What God has given to us in his word is the so source of all hope in this life. It's a source of every hope that we have. You guys, it's in the scriptures that we find that God has made provision for us. It's in the scriptures we, we understand that God is our creator. It's in the scriptures we understand God has sent his only son to redeem us. It's in the scriptures that we learn that God has sent his Holy Spirit to indwell us so that we can understand God's word, be empowered to live out God's word in a way that pleases him. It is our hope it gives us a hope not only of this life, but the life yet to come and all that God has in store for his children. Have you ever seen a person without hope? It is so sad. It is so sad. But God is the source of all hope. It's found in this word. Spurgeon says the argument is that God, having given grace to hope in the promise, would surely never disappoint that hope. He cannot have caused us to hope without cause. If we hope upon his word, we have a sure basis. Our gracious Lord would never mock us by exciting false hopes. Hope is spoken of often in the scriptures. In Psalm 31, 24, be strong and let your heart take courage all you who hope in the Lord. Psalm 33, 18, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope for his steadfast love. Psalm 33, 22, Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us according as we have hoped in you. These famous words in Psalm 42, 5, Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. Psalm 71, 14, but as for me, I will hope continually. That's so beautiful, you guys. If you're here in Christ, you always have hope. In every circumstance, in the darkest of days, you always have hope. He says, but as for me, I will hope continually 
and will praise you yet more and more. Hope for the believer is a precious gift, and it's given to us in God's Word. It's given to us in God's Word. Number two, great benefit of the Word of God is the Word brings comfort. The Word brings comfort. In verse 50, it says, This is my comfort in my affliction, that your Word has revived me. This is my comfort in my affliction, that your Word has revived me. You know, comfort, it's just the idea of encouragement. It's God's word that brings encouragement to us. But when he speaks, when the psalmist speaks of affliction, and you see this throughout the psalms, I mean, how many of you, when you're in your dark days, you start reading the psalms? Because there's so much truth there that deals with hard times in life and then God's provision for us in those hard times. In Psalm 913, the psalmist says, Be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me. Psalm 25, 18, look upon my affliction and my trouble. Forgive all my sins. Psalm 31, 7, I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love because you have seen my affliction. You have known the troubles of my soul. In Psalm 119, you read that the whole chapter and you'll see how often the psalmist refers to the afflictions that he was facing. In Psalm 119, verse 92, the psalmist says this, I love this verse. Okay, if you're not taking any notes at all, just write this one down. 119.92. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. Verse 153 of the same chapter, look upon my affliction and rescue me. For I do not forget your law. Psalmist understood that, that God's word brings comfort in affliction. In Job 6.10, Job uses that same word, comfort, when he says, but it is still my consolation or my comfort, and I rejoice in unsparing pain that I've not denied the words of the Holy One. Paul describes the encouragement the believer receives by contrasting the physical person with the spiritual person. Listen close to this because you're going to need this someday, most likely. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, it says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. It's important that you understand that contrast, okay? Because if you only see one side of the equation, you could get in big trouble. So listen, therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying. Folks, that is a universal reality. Every single one of us in this room is going to suffer that reality and, in fact, is in that process. We don't know how long it takes. Only God knows for each individual. But the truth is, physically, you and I will continue to decline until such day that the Lord chooses to take us home. Some folks can focus so hard on that reality of now the limitations and what I can't and what I wish I could and, you know... But you guys, there's a beautiful picture here, and it's not denying the physical reality, but it's showing a contrast where one is declining and the other one is, is improving dramatically. And that's the essence of the Christian life. So when it says, the outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day, that's simply a reflection of verses like Romans 12:2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. That renewal day by day is as we find our hope in the Scriptures, in our inner being, we're becoming more and more like our Lord. We're living in greater anticipation of the day that we will see Him. Our heart is inclined to want to please Him regardless of the struggles and afflictions that we go through in this life. 
In Colossians 3, 1 and 2, therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on the earth. And so it is that as Christians, we find encouragement. Even though physically we deteriorate, the spiritual work of God in our hearts continues, and we become more prepared for that day that we'll see our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, if this life is all you're living for, I'm sorry. Because that's not what God has in store for his children. It's only for a time. In fact, in this passage in 2 Corinthians 4, it says in verse 17, For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Now, you guys understand, when he says momentary and light affliction, he is not minimizing how hard things can be in this life. How desperately difficult. What he's trying to give us a glimpse of that we will not fully comprehend until glory is that that glory, the magnificence of being with God, that eternal weight of glory, when we come into his presence, will make this seem like nothing. The contrast will be immeasurable. But you know, in this life, we can only see it about that much. There'll be a day that we'll get it. And then he says, why we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. It'll be a glorious thing. Spurgeon says, the worldling clutches, the worldling clutches his money bag and says, this is my comfort. The spent thrift points to his gaiety and shouts, this is my comfort. The drunkard lifts his glass and sings, this is my comfort. But the man whose hope comes from God feels the life-giving power of the word of the Lord and testifies, this is my comfort. This is my comfort. And so in this verse, verse 50, this is my comfort in my affliction. Look what it says, that your word has revived me. That your word has revived me. It's, It's to keep or to restore to life or to preserve life. You know, when we're in the midst of affliction, it is so easy to feel sorry for ourselves. Anybody find that easy? Never mind. It's just easy. It's hard. But you guys, we ought not to run and hide. We can grumble and complain, and that doesn't help. We can get depressed. We can question God's goodness. But the psalmist said, actually, you know where my comfort has come from? It's actually come from God's Word. See, too many people push the Word aside and and feel sorry for themselves. It says, no, 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 no. You guys, in the midst of affliction, in the midst of affliction, your delight is in God's Word. Your comfort is found in God's Word. The, The psalmist understood that. In fact, in this one chapter of Psalm, chapter 119, listen to these verses. In verse 17, He says, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live. It's the same word as revive, that I may live and keep your word. Verse 25. Here's a verse of desperation. My soul cleaves to the dust. That's desperate. Revive me according to your word. In verse 37, turn away my eyes from looking at vanity and revive me in your ways. Verse 77, may your compassion come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. Verse 88, revive me according to your loving kindness so that I may keep the testimony of your mouth. Verse 93, I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have revived me. Verse 107, I am exceedingly afflicted. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. 116, sustain me according to your word that I may live and do not let me be ashamed of my hope. 154, plead my cause and redeem me, revive me according to your word. Great are your mercies in 156, O Lord, revive me according to your ordinances. 159, consider how I love your precepts, revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. 
Psalm 119, 175, let my soul live that it may praise you and let your ordinances help me. Guys, it's the word of God. It's the word of God that brings comfort. I mean, think of the times of your life. As I reflect on the times of my life, I, I mean, I think of a psalm like Psalm 46. I mean, it was just like life-sustaining for me. God's my very present help in time of trouble. Even though the whole world feels like it's fallen apart, that's hope. Or you look at 1 Peter. You see the hope, the, the eternity, the inheritance, imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, even though now for a little while if you're distressed by various trials. And why that happens. That's hope. That's hope. Any of you ever feel like a failure in here? Think of the apostle Peter. God's so kind to reveal Peter's failures but he also reveals God's patience and grace to him and the lessons Peter learned and the lessons Peter passed on to us because of what he learned. You guys, God's word brings comfort. It brings comfort. In fact, uh, Richard Sibbs says this, those comforts in God's word and reasons from thence are wonderful in variety. There is comfort from the liberty of a Christian that he hath free access to the throne of grace. Comfort from the prerogatives of a Christian that he is a child of God, that he is justified, that he is the heir of, salv or the heir of heaven and such like. Comforts from the promises of grace, of the presence of God, of assistance by his presence. I mean, you don't have to think long to see how God worked in people's lives in the midst of difficulty. Think of Joseph or Moses, Abraham and Sarah, Esther and Mordecai, Jeremiah, Daniel, Paul, Peter, John, our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the Bible is full of stories to help us understand God's care and God's comfort in the midst of difficulties. Number three, the word gives us stability in the midst of opposition. The word gives us stability in the midst of opposition. And by the way, I think we all understand that opposition to Christianity in our, in our culture, in our country is, is increasing dramatically, right? I mean, it just seems like there's this increasing effort to, to really um, suppress Christianity in every respect. But I just want you to know there's, there are countries way ahead of us way ahead of, I mean, I, you know, China, of course, is, is just going through an awful time as far as the oppression of Christians there, even saying now that they don't want them to have any religious services as funerals, and, and, and so there's a lot of opposition, yet God continues to build his church. You know, there's believers in North Korea, I mean, you talk about an awful place to live. So God is building his church, and so we see some of that opposition. We don't see it as many do. One day we might. But listen to the, the perspective of the psalmist. He says in verse 51, the arrogant utterly deride me, yet I do not turn aside from your law. When he uses those terms, arrogant, utterly deride, the idea is these are incredibly wicked people who are using all of their effort, all of their energy to, to mock and to scorn and to laugh with contempt and derision. In other words, they hate you. <laughs> They're pouring everything out against you. And you guys, again, uh, sometimes we're a bit of a soft culture, so it's easy to get the poor me's when that happens. But the psalmist says, the arrogant utterly deride me, yet I do not turn aside from your law. I mean, even in our culture today, how many churches now have determined to concede on clear biblical principles to accommodate the culture? I had a conversation with somebody recently and they talked about their pastor and, and uh, what they're tolerating in the church. And, but the, that's not really what the pastor wants, but, but you know, it's kind of the way the church is and, and you know, he's kind of non-confrontational. I said, I don't think that's a pastor. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to be unkind. I don't mean we want to be rudely hostile and con but you guys, we have to speak the truth. We have to. That's why he says the arrogant utterly deride me. He doesn't say, so I make concessions. He says, so I don't turn away from the law. 
And he has great opposition in Psalm 119 alone. In verse 21, it says, you rebuke the arrogant, the cursed who wander from your commandments. In verse 69, the arrogant have forged a lie against me. With all my heart, I will observe your precepts. In verse 78, may the arrogant be ashamed, for they subvert me with a lie, but I shall meditate on your precepts. Verse 85, the arrogant have dug pits for me. Men who are not in accord with your law. I mean, the psalmist knows what it is to have opposition. Thomas Manton said they divided him with all, derided him with all possible bitterness, and day by day they had their scoffs for him, so that it was both a grievous and perpetual temptation. The world hates Christianity. Zimmick says, from a merely human perspective, his response to their heinous actions is totally inexplicable. In the pressure cooker of all such persecution, he maintained that he had not detoured from the Lord's roadmap for life. See, we need to set that course, right? We need to set that course. In verse 157, Psalm 119, many are my persecutors and my adversaries, yet I do not turn aside from your testimonies. William Plummer says, it's a great thing in a soldier to behave well under fire but it is a greater thing for a soldier of the cross to be unflinching in the day of his trial. Unflinching. You know, a lot of people use the word of God as a good luck charm. If I just treat it right, then maybe God will protect me so I don't have to go through hard times. And good. You guys, I don't know, you're not reading the same Bible I'm reading. Because this Bible makes it really clear this is a sinful world and there will be affliction and there will be opposition the question is not whether it's coming it's how do we respond as God has provided the resources for us a New Testament perspective is found in 1st Peter chapter 3 in verse 13 it says who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness you are blessed you're blessed that's what he says even if you suffer for the sake of righteousness you're blessed he says do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled this is what we're supposed to do but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. We see opposition as an opportunity. When we remain steadfast to the truth of the gospel, then people wonder, why do you do that? And when they ask the question, we give the answer. And the answers in the gospel, the hope of the gospel. It goes on and it says, by the way, notice it says with gentleness and reverence. Sometimes it can be dangerously easy to respond to the, our, our opponents in a harsh and ugly way. But that's not God's way. When we respond with the gospel message, it's with gentleness and reverence. And then he says, and keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you were slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better, if God should will it so, and you know he often does, that you suffer for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong. So it says, The arrogant utterly deride me, yet I do not turn aside from your law. And so the law sets the course it reminds us of how to respond in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of opposition. Now, the, the psalmist makes a statement about how important it is for him to remember the ordinances from of old. The psalmist needs to remember the truth of the Word of God. Number four would be the Word helps us know what to tell ourselves. The Word helps us to know what to tell ourselves. So, 
in this verse, he says, I have remembered your ordinances from of old. In other words, I'm spending time so that I know and understand the truth of your word. And then it says, I, I know your ordinance, or I've remembered your ordinances, O Lord, and comfort myself. Or your Bible might say, and take comfort. The idea, when it says comfort myself or take comfort, is that I'm going to the Word of God, and as I spend time in the Word of God, I'm learning what to tell myself about life. Now, let's be honest. How many of you talk to yourself? We all do. Some of us, it's more obvious and awkward than others. <laughs> like driving down the road. Any, any of you like talk to yourself out loud in your car when nobody else is in there? Somebody, raise your hands. Thanks, that just made me feel better. <laughs> if you ever drive by me, just, just say, he's just preaching it himself, just like he does to us. I can't help it, it just happens. All right? We all talk to ourselves. But we don't always tell ourselves the truth. And that leads to big trouble. Big trouble. And see, the point he's saying, I've remembered your ordinances of old... So I've remembered what you say, and he can comfort himself or take comfort is because he's applying what God says to his life. He's speaking the truth back to his own heart, to himself. William Cowper says it's but a mockery of God to desire him to remember his promise made to us when we make no conscience of the promise we have made to him. But alas, how often we fail in this duty and by our own default diminish that comfort we might have of God's promises in the day of trouble. We have to spend time in God's word and speak truth into our own hearts. Folks, oftentimes people want some kind of a mystical comfort, you know, just make me feel better in the midst of whatever I'm in. But you guys, comfort, it's, it's not mystical. It's intentional, and it's recorded in the Scriptures, and it's how we learn to think and understand God and life and circumstances and eternity. People who go through difficulty and push back from the Word of God, push back from the church and those things, it's like, really? You're choosing to reject the very comfort that God offers you. And then we'll likely whine about the fact that God didn't comfort you. But he does. And it's here. And it's available. Probably everybody in this room has the word sitting on their lap or in a phone. An iPad, something. We have it. And, and the psalmist understands that it's the word of God that brings comfort. In... Uh, in Romans 15, verses 4 and 5, it says, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. You understand, God has given it to us so that we can have comfort and affliction, so we know what to say to ourselves. So we speak the truth. David Dixon says, it is good to have a number of examples of God's dealings with his servants laid up in the storehouse of a sanctified memory, and thereby faith may be strengthened in the day of affliction, for so are we here taught. You understand what he's saying? He's saying it's important for us to have the word of God stored up in our minds so that when those times of affliction come, we draw from the truth of God's word, and then we speak the truth to our own souls. God is a God of comfort in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. I, I think that's quite a beautiful verse, actually. When it says that God comforts us in all of our affliction, it's interesting that, that in saying that, he doesn't say so that you will be able to comfort somebody else who's in the same affliction. He just says, no, that as you've experienced the comfort of God in your circumstance, then you will be able to comfort others in whatever their circumstances are. So do keep in mind, Christian, when you benefit from God's comfort in your life, 
God's intent is that you use what he's done in your life to comfort other people. To comfort other people. That's part of God's work. It's easy to feel sorry for us ourselves in the midst of affliction. You know, I think of Elijah. Eli- I love the story of Elijah. Elijah was such a faithful man, godly man, saw such great things happen, but he wasn't a perfect man like, you know, truth is we're all kind of a mess, right? And remember, he got to that one point of difficulty and, and he, he suffered some pretty severe disappointment with God, didn't go the way he thought. And you remember what he did? He exaggerated his circumstances, you know? I mean, he was in a bad circumstance, but he exaggerated the story. Started feeling sorry for himself, and then he ran away. (laughs) God was so patient with him as he is with us. Going, correcting his thinking, and I'm not sure that Elijah ever fully got it in this life, but he did now. I think one of the most humorous parts of Elijah's story is remembering that process. He said, God, just take me home, take me home. I bet later he was so glad that God actually didn't do that because then he got, you know, this special ride. (laughs) Careful what you ask for. We find what we need to tell ourselves in God's word. Number five, the word gives us the right perspective of the wicked. Look at verse 53. I mean, these are pretty powerful words. He says, burning indignation has seized me because of the wicked who forsake your law. I mean, burning indignation is like raging heat, a feeling of righteous anger, and it's seized him. That is its grasp. It's taken possession of him. That's a pretty powerful picture. I mean, even as we look around our own culture, it's just, it's just tragic so much of what's happened. The, the wickedness and the, the hatefulness, the hatefulness towards God, the hatefulness towards Christianity, the, just, just this, this anger in our culture. It's awful. But you guys, the psalmist is not without emotion. He's not unaffected by the prevalent sin in the world. One person, one commentator said, the psalmist grieved not because he, he was himself attacked, but because the law of God was forsaken. You see that? Burning indignation has seized me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Sometimes it's easier to be mad at people for what they do to me, but, but here he sees that it's a violation of God's law. It's a dishonoring of God. The commentator said... He's grieved not because he himself was attacked, because of the law of God was forsaken, and he bewailed the condemnation of those who so did because they are lost to God. There's, there's a couple of sides to this equation, folks. I mean, one hand, on one hand, there's this, this awful wickedness that's, that is pervasive in the culture, and we should hate sin. Let me say, hate it, first of all, where? In my own life. It's easier to hate sin in other people's lives, by the way. It's a harder thing to hate sin in your own life. But you start with hating it in your own life, and then you can hate the sin that is everywhere. But you guys, in hating the sin and seeing the wickedness and the violence against God, don't ever forget that these blind, wicked people will suffer the judgment of God if they don't respond to the gospel. You know, in Psalm 2, it says, Why are the nations in an uproar, and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. Now, let's transition. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment, take warning, O judges of the earth, worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that he may not become angry and you perish in the way. 
for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Folks, we should hate the sin. We should hate the response to a holy God. But we also must never forget that as long as an unbeliever is alive, even living in their wickedness, there's hope for the gospel message in their heart. We want to make sure that we're careful to be faithful in ministering the gospel, even as 1 Peter 3 said, even to those who hate us and who oppose us. You know, some people can get so consumed, even professing believers, with the wickedness of the world. That's all they're thinking of is that it's so wicked. I hate, you know, and fear for my kids and my grandkids. My da, 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 da. But you guys, God's never had a problem taking care of his own in the history of the world. I don't expect it's going to happen. We need to be concerned with the things that God's concerned about. Now, I think that there's a, a pretty neat swing here between verse 53 and 54. Razimic says it this way. Between these verses, the pendulum swings from the treachery of the godless to the tranquility of the godly. <laughs> so number six, the word puts a song in our heart. The word puts a song. So on one hand, he's talking about this, this righteous anger towards the wickedness, and in, in, in the very next verse is a song in my heart. And there is this biblical Christian balance that we have. In verse 54, your statutes are my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. This temporary abode, this place where we currently are, your statutes are my songs. For some people, they are consumed with burning indignation, but you guys, we need to hate the wickedness, but don't lose the song. Don't lose the song that's in your heart. Spurgeon says, like others of God's servants, the psalmist knew that he was not at home in this world, but a pilgrim through it seeking a better country. He did not, however, sigh over this fact, but he sang about it. I mean, we sing at funerals. Why do we sing at funerals? Because we have a song to sing. You heard these songs this morning, folks. We have a song in this dark world that's so precious. Think of, think of Acts 16, verses 19 and following. You remember the slave girl who was demon-possessed? And uh, she was a fortune teller, and, and uh, she was delivered from that demon. <laughs> and, and so uh, when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace. What did they do to them? I mean, they beat them up, okay? They, they beat them up. Beat them with rods, struck them with many blows, threw them into prison, made sure they guarded them securely, and these men at midnight are doing what? Praying and singing. Can you imagine the men in that prison? This is really weird. These guys just got beat to a pulp. It's the middle of the night, and they're singing hymns of praise to their God. Ah. We have a song to sing. Every now and then, Tom will say something about in the congregation. When we're singing, it doesn't make sense for an, a believer to not sing. I mean, it, it, it just doesn't. We, there should be a song in our heart. My, my grandkids might refer to you kind of as a grumpy gill. You know, that stoic, I just don't. But you know what? It's pretty sad. It's pretty sad. Because we have something to sing about. I don't mean it has to be good. I always turn my mic off when I sing. <laughs> you probably never listen to me again. I left it on. Oh, that just, that's like my worst, one of my worst nightmares. Oh. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. Okay, we've got to move on. <laughs> Boyce says, the singing of Christians does not make the causes of their sorrows go away, though the Lord sometimes does that himself, but it does lift their spirits and testifies to the goodness of God who provides comfort even in bad times. Psalm 89.1, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. To all generations, I will make known your faithfulness with my mouth. And then number seven, the word reminds us of the author of the word. 
The word reminds us of the author of the word. In verse 55, O Lord, I remember your name in the night and keep your law. Far too many people struggle to give any thought to God throughout the day or the night. The psalmist is focused on God and God's word both day and night. In a few brief words, the psalmist reminds us that the word is associated with a specific person. He remembers God's name, and here that name is Lord. It's Yahweh, the God of Israel, the covenant-keeping God, the one who remembers his word to his servant. This is the God of the Bible. This is the author of the Bible. He says, oh, Lord, I remember your name in the night. You know, at night, it's easy to wake up with worries of the world in our hearts, isn't it? Wake up. Some people struggle sleeping. We have one of those clocks that puts the time on the ceiling. I had one of those nights last night. I'm looking at the clock going, oh, that's not good. <laughs> I mean, it'd really be bad if I fell asleep during my sermon. <laughs> you stay awake. Okay. But you guys, here's the deal. When we wake at night, the psalmist says, think on God. Think on the author of God's word. Think on the word. And you guys, those night watches are times that we can pray and times that we can worship without distraction. Without distraction. And the psalmist sees that as a good thing. And in Psalm 119, verse 62, it says, At midnight I shall rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous ordinances. Or verse 148, My eyes anticipate the night watches that I may meditate on your word. Psalm 63, 6, when I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. Psalm 77, 6, I will remember my song in the night. I will meditate with my heart and my spirit ponders. Spurgeon says he found sanctification through meditation. By the thoughts of the night, he ruled the actions of the day. As the actions of the day often create the dreams of the night, so do the thoughts of the night produce the deeds of the day. If we do not keep the name of God in our memory, we shall not keep the law of God in our conduct. Forgetfulness of minds leads to forgetfulness of life. So those are seven great benefits that we see in this short passage of Scripture. Let me just remind you that those are eight verses. This chapter is 176 verses long. So just be assured, I have not given you an exhaustive list. It's just from these few verses. But in verse 56, it is a reminder that, that God's word is of a very personal nature. The psalmist says, this has become mine, that I observe your precepts. He started at the beginning saying, remember the word, your word to your servant. You guys, this has everything to do with, with you, those of you who are in Christ and God. You know, do you see yourself as God's servant? And, and would you be the person that says, this is mine. I, I take ownership of this. I, I, I'm a servant that wants to obey the precepts. I want to obey God's word. That's important to me. That's what my life, I want my life to be like. I, I want to be the servant who's doing everything he can to please the master, to honor the master. So in this passage, the psalmist says, God, remember your word to your servant. The psalmist says, I will remember the ancient words. And he remembers the God of the word. He's reminded us that the word gives hope, brings comfort, gives us stability in the midst of opposition, helps us to know what to tell ourselves, gives us the right perspective of the wicked, puts a song in our heart, reminds us of the author of the word. The word of God is so precious, folks, and God has given it to us. He's given it to us. So my simple prayer is that as you approach God's word this, this week, that you would approach it as a servant who wants to learn from the master to be able to please him, and that your time would be rich in God's word this week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. You're so kind. You're so generous. You're so patient. Your provision is beyond anything that we could ever have dreamed. And we know that in this life, we will never fully comprehend it. So we simply bow and say thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your word and your spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ, so many things you've abundantly blessed us with. We love you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.